Well, our message, as always, is going to come from our Great Adventure reading. And if you guys haven't been a part of that, I invite you to be a part of that. Always room this time of year for a New Year's resolution. And the Great Adventure is nothing more than just simply reading through the Bible. There's a prescribed reading every day, and it's just a, a little bit of the Old Testament, uh, a psalm, and part of a psalm, part of a, a proverb, and things to where in three years' time, we will have all read through the Bible together. So I just want to invite you to join that and to be a part of that. There's booklets on the way out that you can get. You can get it online, uh, just exactly where we'll be. But <clears throat> Pastor Rick, or whoever is teaching, will be teaching from those chapters uh, on each Sunday. So one of those daily reading, part of that daily reading, will be the topic uh, for our different uh, messages that come on Sunday. And so those of you that are really interested, you can maybe start a pool and see, we'll put on there out of seven chapters what Pastor Rick is going to teach on, and we can put a few bucks on each one and see who gets to take, take the pool home. No, I'm just kidding, honest, but... <clears throat> This week's reading is uh, 2 Kings chapters 4 through 10. So this morning's message, or it's almost afternoon, I think, <clears throat> this message will come from 2 Kings chapter 5. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to 2 Kings chapter 5. We've been both going through the history of Israel and the history of, uh, of Judah, and 1 Kings, 2 Kings talks about this history, but all of these different kings that are involved across the land of Israel, these kings that God has allowed to be in place, God always sends a little insurance program. He sends a prophet, and this prophet is to help these kings stay on track. Many of the prophets were ignored, many of the prophets were even killed, but God is faithful to continue to provide these prophets, and you can see all kinds of different graphs and charts in the Bible that show which prophet are associated with which kings. And in our reading this week through Second uh, Kings chapter 5, we're uh, introduced to a, or we've been introduced this week to a man named Elisha. I actually met a young man named Elisha. There's a lot of Elijahs with the J but not so many with the Elisha. And uh, I was real surprised when he uh, said his name was Elisha. And I said, do you know the difference between Elijah and Elisha? I got a Bible lesson. This guy was a waiter at a restaurant. I got, he knew immediately he happened to be a Christian, and it was really kind of fun because a lot of people might name their son Elijah, but I have never heard of another person in my uh, lifespan that's been, in, been named after Elisha. And Elijah <coughs> is... As he goes off the scene, he uh, appoints or anoints, by God's direction, Elisha to continue his ministry as a prophet to the nation of Israel. And that mantle, as it's passed, there's a number of different um, ways that that took place. Elijah actually trained Elisha, and Elisha waited on Elijah, and then as Elisha Elijah, excuse me, was taken up into heaven, Elijah watched that, and he prayed, Lord, Give me a double portion of that which you gave to Elijah. And God did that. So we see in 2 Kings, as you count, if you wanted to, the, the miracles that are done, we see that Elijah did 16 miracles, and Elisha is credited with 32 miracles. But the Lord balances that out, because in the New Testament, we see that Elijah was mentioned in the New Testament some 29 times, and Elisha is only mentioned once, and it's about his role in this chapter 5 of 2 Kings that we're going to look at today. So, the name Elisha means God is salvation, and so we're going to, we're going to follow this part of his ministry in this chapter. Um, this event dealing with Naaman, a uh, commander of the Syrian army, and as we hear it <clears throat> through this, this narrative, this event is written in a number of different uh, books, not just the Bible. <clears throat> in fact, if you read the Quran, you're going to find this event is actually chronicled in the Quran as well as a number of other Jewish books and historical books. And, and then, of course, as I just mentioned, Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, verses 25 through 27, talks about these two miracles, this, the one miracle before that Elijah did with the widows, and then a foreign widow, and then Elisha ministered to this, this uh, Syrian commander. And the Syrians, just like today, are enemies of Israel. They've always been, 
and it appears as if they're always going to be. The Lord does things in, in amazing different ways, but uh, <clears throat> Syria is a hotbed, if you will, of ISIS kind of activity. So when I talk about Naaman, a commander of the Syrian army, if we were to going to bring that into kind of today's uh, context of today's history and stuff, this God ministering to Naaman, commander of the Syrian army, would be like God inviting the commander of ISIS to come to the United States and have maybe some surgery or something like that. We're going to see that this commander had leprosy, and so he heard about a prophet in Israel to get healed, so he came here. So again, you can see that this, this context, <clears throat> it really helps us to understand that this, this war, if you will, this conflict between Syria and Israel was ongoing. And for when Jesus said, you know, there are a lot of, there are a lot of lepers all over Israel, but God only healed one, and he was a commander of the Syrian army. And, and they took Jesus for saying that and to the brow of a hill and tried to throw him off to kill him. And of course, you know the story as he walked back through the crowd and <clears throat> escaped that day just uh, miraculously and, and things. But you can see how upset God's chosen people were. But there's a message in this for us today as we look at that. We're going to look at six different people and their parts in this unique glimpse in this chapter 5 of 2 Kings. But the most, important, the most important person that's being used in this is an unnamed slave girl. And all through scripture we see how God uses unimportant so-called people that are, have no specific role, no specific uh, reputation or, or anything that's well known. And this servant girl is a perfect example of that. And then <clears throat> we're going to see as other people are two kings, the king of Syria, the king of uh, Israel is used, and then the prophet Elijah, and then this commander of the Syrian army. And then another servant or two gets in the picture as we go through this. But the other thing that I want to leave, and I'm going to give you the primary message for this whole message up front so that you guys can rest and take a little nap, and you won't have to listen to all the rest of the stuff. If you'll grasp this, then I would be happy. I would be content if you're able to take this home. But the message in chapter 5 of 2 Kings that I took away from this is that God steps out of the Israeli nation, and he goes over into Syria, this enemy nation, and he takes a famous enemy captain, commander, general, and he takes him out, and, and he's afflicted with a disease, and he takes him and brings him into Israel, and then heals him. And the message for us is that, number one, is that God has a plan. And he doesn't always do things according to the way we would do them. But God has a plan. And just like this Syrian general, each one of us is like this Syrian general. We are not Israelis, most of us. We are not Hebrew. We are not Jewish. And so those chosen people, God has reached out and showed us almost 3,000 years later that I have a plan for each one of you. I have a way for each one of you me to be healed and to be set free from this affliction. You see, in the Old Testament, Leviticus and different places, leprosy is usually a picture of sin in our lives. And this physical leprosy that we see here in today's story is a reminder to us as individuals that God has a plan to help us with our spiritual leprosy, our spiritual cancer, this disease of sin that we have, thanks to Adam and Eve, nothing personal. The Bible says that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so we have this concept of needing a Savior. And so as we go through this, we're going to see how Naaman took this journey of almost 100 miles to find that saving grace. And God was faithful. And God awarded his willingness to seek that out. And so God steps out of this whole plan that he has for Israel, the prophets of Israel, the kings of Israel, and miracles that were done, all kinds of physical uh, miracles that are done and things. And he steps out of that and steps right into the enemy camp and takes a person that's a Gentile, takes a person that's against God, takes a person that has no history with God or any knowledge of God, just like many of us. And he heals him of that spiritual cancer. And that's the message for us, that God has a plan, God is sovereign, and he started telling us this plan almost 3,000 years ago. Most of this took place somewhere around 840, 850 uh, B.C. 
is when Elijah supposedly lived with King Joram and uh, Ben-Hadad, the other king. So, <clears throat> it's uh, interesting, though, to see what it is that gets our attention. And sometimes God gets our attention through cancer. Sometimes God gets it, uh, our attention through a sickness or a disease. Sometimes God gets our attention through events in our life that are, that are uh, relationship in nature, financial in nature, all kinds of ways. But just like this general, he gets his attention. But the other thing that uh, God is trying to show us here is that connection between the spiritual and the physical. See, we as Americans especially are pretty material guys. I'm a material guy, okay? And, uh, and most of us in America are pretty focused on the physical, the material, and, and those kinds of things. But God, all through what he's doing, is trying to help us to make that change, that transition, you will, in our thinking and our living practices into the spiritual. And so even though this man had a skin disease, if you will, like leprosy, it's probably not leprosy as such, but some kind of skin disease... This message is about the cancer that's in our hearts of sin and the, and the, and the unforgiveness and all these different things that we care with, carry with us. Maybe some of you aren't as bad as a sinner as I am. You know that uh, Pastor Rick likes to stand up here and share all about his history and his testimony and things, but you're not going to catch me doing that. Every once in a while there's somebody that comes in that knows me, you know, and we escort them out of the church so that they're not... Uh, <laughs> able to communicate with you guys. But the point I'm trying to make is that no matter what we've done in an external sense in our heart, Jesus said, you know, if you've even been angry at somebody, you've committed murder. If you've even lusted after a woman in your heart, you've committed uh, adultery with her. So we're all toast. And the Bible confirms that. So in a spiritual sense, we have a need. But many people today, especially in America, don't understand this need. And so this little chapter, this little uh, section where God steps completely out of Israel to do this awesome miracle is a message for all of us that God has after you, each one of you. And if you're here today and you haven't received Christ as your Savior, if you haven't been cleansed from your sin, just like we, we, we sang that song, nothing but the blood of Jesus will cleanse us. There's nothing else that can take away that sin. But we have to surrender to it. We have to invite it. We have to embrace it. We have to uh, have that humility that, that we see here in this context. Just to confirm, in the New Testament sense, Paul talks about this, and uh, oftentimes I'll share this as we do funerals around here. In 2 Corinthians 4.18, it says that while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things that are unseen are eternal. The physical part of each one of us is going away. Our bodies are like a tent. And we're going to die. This outside tent is just going to go away. Uh, the older I get, the more aware I am of that concept. And it doesn't mean much. In the last service, I just asked people to rise, raise their hands if they know where their great-grandfather is buried. And I think I saw like five or ten hands. I think some of the people are afraid to raise their hands in church. They're going to get sent to Egypt or something. But... <laughs> It's just so, nobody knows my great-grandfather anymore. And, and that whole generation has passed away. And, and the Bible says, and they remember him, its place no more. So you guys think you're really hot stuff and you're really important, but in a, in a few years, we're all going to be history. And history that nobody can even dig up. It doesn't matter. But the spiritual part of us, the spiritual part of you, your soul is eternal. It lasts forever. And, and this is what we're talking about here today as we make that transition. God wants us to make that transition, to understand that he has a plan to heal you from your spiritual cancer, from your spiritual leprosy. Okay, I'll, get, I'll move on. As we read verses 1 through 7, as we look at the first four por persons in this story. So if you have a Bible, chapter 5, <coughs> 2 Kings, it says, Now Naaman, the commander of the Syrian, or the army of the king of Syria was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but a leper. And the Syrians had gone out on raids and had brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel. She waited on Naaman's wife. Then she said to her mistress, If only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. 
And Naaman went in and told his master, saying, Thus and thus said the girl who was from the land of Israel. Then the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. Then he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which said, Now be advised, when this letter comes to you, that I have sent Naaman my servant to you, you, that you may heal him of his leprosy. And it happened when the king of Israel read the letter that he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make alive? That this man sends a man to me to heal him of his leprosy. Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks a quarrel with me. We see this progression now that a little servant girl has been taken captive and she sends a message to her master. And this is a little Jewish girl. But Naaman, as we start this out, his name means pleasant. Naaman is a commander of the Syrian army and he has been leading raids into Israel, uh, killing and capturing these slaves like this little girl that he took home to be his, slave, his wife's slave. And this has been going on and is still going on to this day as Syria is uh, allowing raids to take place against Israel, against Christians and, and things through ISIS. And they're also involved in a huge civil war in, in right now. But this captain, this commander of the army, whose name means pleasant, was a leper as well as being rich and famous and, uh, and somebody to be, to be reckoned with. He was a Gentile, and that's the most important thing, is that this is outside of Israel. And this, is, this is just unheard of in that day. This is God's chosen people, and he stepped right out, and as Jesus said, <clears throat> that there are a lot of lepers in the land, but he never healed any, God never healed any, except this Syrian, this commander, this enemy, if you will. But the blemish, if you will, was on his soul, and he had this great need, but he was open and seeking. And Jesus continues this thought for us today in a New Testament sense in Matthew 7, verses 7 and 8. He says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receive and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it will be opened. Naaman was willing to travel over a hundred miles to find this gift, if you will, this, this healing that took place, this great power. They had no medicine, they had no way of dealing with this. Always a fatal disease. And very, very, I remember watching Ben-Hur when I was a little kid, and um, I had nightmares for months and months after about that leprosy, that leprous colony that was there. It just scared me to death. I'd never heard of anything. And, and I just was sure that I was going to come down with leprosy. But... <clears throat> Naaman understood the consequences of this disease. So for us, as we contemplate this and see where we're at in this and maybe relate to Naaman, that some of you have a great need. Some of you have something going on in your life. Maybe nobody else even knows what's going on. Some of you know. In the last few weeks, we prayed with a number of people that uh, asked for prayer before they go before a judge. And they've got felony convictions and they're out waiting that sentencing and things. They have a great need. But they came and they were seeking God's relief. They were seeking God's healing. They were seeking God's power to help them through that time in life. And some of you are here today probably with a great need like this. And you're in the right place. <clears throat> the other person we see is um, this little slave girl. And I think she's kind of the hero of this whole thing. And she is definitely not just a slave, not just a servant in that sense. But she was a servant of the Most High God. Many of us today, I think God would like us all to be servants. In Matthew 23, 11, uh, Jesus said, but he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. The word minister means serve, servant. And most ministers don't know that, no offense. But uh, that concept of being service, he who wants to be greatest in the kingdom of God needs to be a servant. This little girl, probably 13, 14, 15 years old, taken captive, perhaps her parents were killed. She's in a foreign land. She's, she's uh, a slave, and slaves have no rights. Slave has no standing, and, and, and that kind of place. But she knew who 
God was and was able somehow to communicate that. It seems like her master must have been a, a decent sort and, and both the, the, the mistress and the master were, were decent in a sense because she had great care and concern when she saw that leprosy that she spoke out to them. And we see in this message today that a number of times, different times through this message, God uses the servant, not the prophet, not the king, not the great commander or anything else in this. God does a lot of his work in this message by a servant. So let me ask you where you're at. Are you a servant? Do you know enough about God to share with somebody at work that has a great need or somebody in your family that has a great need? Do you have enough to share with them? Hey, this is what you need to do. You need to go take that healed and set free class. You need to get in a Bible study. Are you reading God's word? Are you praying? Have you asked God, have you asked Jesus to come into your heart and to forgive you of your sins? The greatest leprosy or cancer that any of us have. And, and, and as you, are you that kind of that little servant girl that knows enough about God to share that? I think that's why, to me, she's the greatest hero. But this is supernatural. The same thing happened to uh, Joseph and Daniel as they were taken captive and taken to a foreign country. But they kept their focus and their eyes on the Lord. And they are sometimes much better witnesses than these great prophets and, and, and different things that were doing all these miracles. Because just in that quietness, just in that place of great need, they're able to share. You know, it's too bad you can't go into Samaria, or into Samaria, there's a prophet there. He can heal you of your leprosy. What confidence. But it's really, <clears throat> it's really bizarre in a sense because um, number one, nobody in Syria would ever listen to a slave, let alone a king, let alone a commander of the army. Nobody would listen to a Jewish slave. Nobody would listen to a teenager. Nobody would listen to a female Yes, in their culture, that's just the way it was. And it, as we read this text, it's so fascinating to me that the minute she says something, then we have Naaman that just picks it right up and runs right out. Hey, the king, to the king and says, hey, this little servant girl from Israel said if I go to Samaria, I can be healed. They've been trying to wipe Israel off the map. And, and yet, she, he just grasps this concept, and the king says, oh, well, that sounds good. Here, let me give you a letter of, of free passage, just like that commander of ISIS I talked about. Go ahead, head over to the United States. They'll take care of you. They'll heal you of your cancer. Uh, I'm not sure we're that generous. I'm not sure that we would be able to do that. But you see the context this is in. It's amazing. It's a miracle that he even listened to her. But remember, God has a plan for each one of us. God has a purpose. He is sovereign through all these things. And he injected this little chapter in here for us to give us hope, to understand that God's been working for 3,000 years to tell us that he has a plan for our salvation. He has a way to be healed, of us to be healed for our cancer of the soul, for that sin that lies inside of us. I don't know about most of you, but I know myself, if I had been this servant... If I had been captured as a little boy and found myself in Argentina or Hungary or, or Russia or someplace like that, and now I'm a captive and, and my parents don't know where I am and, and things like that, I'll bet you there's a pretty good chance, knowing me, I'd have been angry and bitter. And, and that bitterness, <clears throat> that focus on me and my circumstances would have totally eliminated what God wanted to do. This girl understood there is something bigger out there than me. I think that's part of what we need to understand in here is that God has a plan and a purpose for every one of us that wants to make that journey, that wants to go and seek and ask and look for and find those things, what God can do, do in our hearts. But I think I probably would have been bitter and angry and why am I here and I'm, you know, just... You know what you have to do to get by so you don't get beaten or, or, or some other th kind of thing that happens or just flat killed or abandoned and things. That's all I probably would have been focused on. And this little girl was just the opposite of that. That bitterness when circumstances in life, when you realize maybe you got the letter that says that, yeah, we've, we've done a biopsy and you have cancer. Maybe it's not all physical. Maybe there's some of it that's spiritual. Maybe somebody serves you papers and you've gotten a divorce. Maybe you have to file bankruptcy because of some different circumstances in things and you've gotten that message. You know, do we get bitter or do we get better? 
Do you understand that God has the cure for that leprosy, for whatever that message that you've received, that disaster in your life, that hard thing in your life? Are you focused on God and looking at him and seeking him? Or are you like I'd probably be focused on myself? Man, this stinks. Why is this happening to me? This isn't fair. What's going on with this? And I serve God. I, I come to church and, and do all kinds of things. Why is this happening in my life? Well, I can pretty much know when anybody comes to me and they say, Pastor, why? I just tune it out from that end. I have no answer for why. Other than God is in charge. God has a plan. See, I read about it. 3,000 years ago, he began working on this plan for each one of us to have access to that healing, to have access to that cure. In Hebrews 12, 15, uh, the writer of Hebrews encourages us, he said, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Her bitterness would have defiled that whole household if this little servant girl had turned a different direction as the writer of Hebrews so rightly identifies. Bitterness is contagious. Bitterness takes away the joy. Bitterness is a, is a focus on self rather than being focused on God. Over the years, I too have had issues with this. I've learned to uh, look more and more, hmm, I wonder what God's doing in this. I think I'll go to coffee and see how this works out. But God really does work all things together for good. This message is priceless. And this message isn't always in our community or in our lives or in our world today. This coming Wednesday, the 30th of December, in the evening, we've been asked to host a prayer meeting slash birthday party for Dior Kuntz. It'll be his third birthday. He's been missing since July. And his family, his parents, his grandparents want to come and have kind of a birthday party. They don't want it to be a, a memorial service. They don't want it to be like a funeral or giving up hope. They're, they're working hard at, at, uh, through cooperating with the officials, the FBI, and, and, and different things, trying to find a resolution, praying that that little boy would be found and be returned to them. But what do I say when they come in? What does the rest of the world have to offer? And just as Naaman comes to the prophet here, comes with his need, as they're going to come with their need on Wednesday, I can share that God is good all the time. And even though we don't understand, this little servant girl, 13 years old, in captivity, in Syria, do you think she understood the big picture? Do you think she knew that 3,000 years later we're going to be up here telling her story? about what God had done in this miraculous way to heal this man, that we could all be encouraged and, and hear about this, and that God has a, has a sovereign plan to take people that are not his chosen people, people maybe that feel like they're outcasts. Maybe they feel like they've been forgotten. Maybe they feel like they've been abandoned. And yet he has a solution to that, as we're going to see as Naaman experiences that. Well, another person here is the king of Syria. That happened to be Ben-Hadad. Uh, the second, and he's the one that wrote this letter for safe passage. And uh, then the next one is the king of Israel, who is Joram. King of Israel really fell down on this deal. When he got the letter and when he received Naaman, obviously he wasn't too pleased to have the c commander of the enemy forces in his castle, in his town. But yet he had nothing to offer and he knew that. Spiritually, he was bankrupt. This leprosy thing was out of his control. And again, just like so many of us, when something like that happens, we take it personal. He got angry because he thought, what's up with these people sending this letter to me? Who do they think I am? Do they think I'm like God, that I have the power to heal, that I have the power to kill and to make alive? I don't have that power. At least he was right about that much. But here is this prophet that God sent specifically to him, this prophet Elisha. And, and it appears as if Elisha was far enough removed from the, from the whole thing that, that he knew what was going on, but he was far enough away that the king didn't have anything to do with him. The king, was, the king was bankrupt. The king had nothing to offer in all his power and all his glory and, and, and things. He had nothing, and he knew that, and it made him mad that he didn't have anything to offer. 
We kind of relate to that today. <clears throat> when you have some kind of trouble like that, and uh, you go to the government for help. Some of us do. There's no other place to go in a sense. But it's not the greatest help, is it? It costs more uh, on one side to pay for the other side that where we're getting the help. It's not very effective. And Joram, King, or yeah, King Joram knew that. Let's read verses um, 8 through 19 as we look a little bit and see more about this prophet Elisha. It says, So it was, then Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Please let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Then Naaman went with his horses and chariot, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be restored to you and you shall be clean. But Naaman became furious and went away and said, indeed, I said to myself, he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. Are not the Abana, Abana and the Far Par, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned away and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, Wash and be clean? So he went down, dipped in seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And he returned to the man of God, he and all his aides, and came and stood before him, and he said, Indeed, now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Now therefore, please take a gift from your servant." But he said, as the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive nothing. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. So Naaman said, then if not, please let your servant be given two mule loads of earth, for your servant will no longer offer either burnt offering or sacrifice to other gods, but to the Lord. And it goes on to talk about how he asked for forgiveness for Going with the king into the temple of Ramon, the foreign god that was there in Damascus. And so we see how Elijah, the servant, had a true understanding of the situation. And the other thing that we knew is that the main thing that Elijah extends here, and this is what is also important for us, this is one of the times in the Bible where God, through this commander of the enemy, this enemy, commander of the enemy armies that came, God extended something that's just priceless. And he's been extending this to us too, if we are willing to receive it. And that's the concept of grace. This man did not deserve to be getting healed in the nation of Israel. He was an enemy of Israel. It says that we, when we're in the world and without Christ in our hearts, we're at enmity with God. And, and so, but yet God still reaches out and in his great grace, he extends to Naaman through Elijah this grace and Elijah extends that grace to him. Now, Elijah did something unique. He never even came out of the house. And as I thought about that and pondered that, and he sent his servants, again, we see how the Lord uses a servant to minister in this way, but the Lord just, <clears throat> Elijah knew who was going to do the healing. It wasn't him, it was God. And sometimes we can get in the way of what God wants to do, and sometimes we can even steal that glory. But here's God with an incredible story, an incredible example through Elijah of extending grace to a man that deserved nothing. And, and, and so this principle, if you will, even back 3,000 years ago was beginning to be demonstrated to us as we have the Word of God today and begin to apply it to our lives. And that same grace is available to every one of us if we will seek it, if we will will listen to God's prophets through his word, by his Holy Spirit, and begin to understand no matter what you've done. As you seek God and you are obedient to what he says, you can experience that same kind of healing spiritually and many times physically as well. God is still sovereign. He chose to heal this one leper and he didn't heal any of the other lepers that lived in Israel that day. 
A thousand years later, Jesus stood up and, and used that as an illustration to try and convict the Israeli people of that time, the Pharisees and things, of their wrong path. They were stealing the glory. They would have been the first ones to accept a gift for something that God did. Or Elijah knew better than that. He stayed in his house. He never even came out because it was God that was going to do the healing. Elisha had been placed there by God to minister to the kings, and yet they refused him. So God opened that healing up, that ministry, that grace to others. Well, we have ministry here about Nahum, just like many of us resisted. I don't know how many times I've talked to people and asked them um, if they know who Jesus is if they've asked for forgiveness for their sins and, and things. And, and they say, well, how do you do that? And I say, well, it's easy. You just have to believe in Jesus. You have to believe in his death. You have to believe in his burial and resurrection. And it talks about that in Corinthians and, and in Romans chapter uh, 10, verses 9 and 10. It says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And they just look at me and go, well, if it's that simple, why doesn't everybody do it? Shouldn't we do something hard? I heard that a lot. And, 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 things that, and, and it's just a gift that God has given us. And it is very, very simple. But you have to come to that place of acknowledging your need. <clears throat> you and I were born with cancer of the soul, with leprosy of the soul, and that is sin. And we come into this world that way. David said that we're all conceived in iniquity. And, and we have this need. We just don't all re always realize it. We're pretty good people, most of us. I know some of you. But uh, most of you are pretty good people and, and things. But we have a need. And, and that need is, is for that healing to take place, for that cancer in a spiritual sense, not just the physical sense. Sometimes it's physical as well. But Naaman got mad. He had that pride. He had that preoccupation with self. He says, well, if it's that easy, he said, there's rivers all over in Damascus. Why don't I go there into one of those good rivers? And he said, no, it's got to be the Jordan. <clears throat> but he got over that, and again, the servant spoke to him and shared with him. He said, my father, if they'd asked you to do something hard, wouldn't you have done that? And then he finally got him to settle down and cool off, and he came to that place. You know, I've come this far. I'm just going to surrender I'm just going to do what he says. says that he dipped in the river, or yet he uh, went into the river, but the, the real, probably a better translation for that word in the Hebrew would be that he plunged into the river. Oh, that people, recognizing their need, would plunge into Jesus and surrender to him. And of course, the number seven is kind of God's number. It's this number of completeness. So that seven times of him dipping in the river, plunging in the river, was uh, symbolic of God's complete healing that is available to each one of us if we'll surrender. And again, that grace, not only was he just uh, humble and, re and received that uh, in, as he dipped in the river and things, but it says that his flesh was made like a little child. Not only did he just heal it and he went away clean, but now he was totally restored from head to toe. All of his flesh was just like a little child. That's this concept that I've learned to understand from the Lord. And that concept is that our God, our Jesus, is an over-the-top kind of guy. And he not only just heals us, he not only just takes the place of our sins, which is mercy, but he goes into this whole concept of grace that this, little, that this man's skin was like that of a little child. And, and that is so like our God to go above and beyond. I couldn't help but think about the Jordan River. <clears throat> and I think there's some slides here of the Jordan River. This, this is supposedly the site on the Jordan River where Jesus was baptized. I'm not sure if that's accurate, but this is looking from the Israel side of the Jordan River across the river into Jordan. And that gal you see standing there, the river's about from me to this front row, and, and things, and we're, here's this whole uh, group of us, there's 12 or 14 of us from here at Water Springs that went to Israel last year, and there's this girl over there, so we say, hey, how are you? And she answered in English, and she turns out that she's from the United States, 
and she is a teacher in Jordan. And she's over there by herself. She actually took a picture of us with her iPhone, and then was gonna, and we're all lined up on the other side. And I <clears throat> was going to email that to us because we just hollered back and forth email addresses and, and things like that. But that gives you an idea. This is the Jordan River. You can see how Naaman was not, you know, what's up with this? What's such a big deal about the Jordan River? But she was by herself on the Jordanian side, and then this is that same place, just looking upstream. As you can see, this was actually in flood stage. And, and uh, as you can see, the handrails where people would go down, and if they want to get baptized, the same place that Jesus was baptized, you could go down and walk down there. But right behind where these pictures were taken were um, lots of soldiers. And, and the soldiers over there are amazing. Uh, they're like 18, 19, and the girls are just gorgeous, but they got this fully mat automatic Uzi, and they're just glaring at you. Okay, and if that little girl across the river had decided to come our way, she'd have been in deep trouble. And if we had stepped into the water and went past the middle, we also would be in deep trouble. This is the border between Israel and Jordan. That's the Jordan River. So you can see why Naaman was kind of like, Come on, this isn't even a decent river. I mean, the Idaho Canal is better than that and cleaner than that here in Idaho Falls. And, and Willow Creek is actually a little better in some places than, than that is. So anyway, that's uh, <clears throat> a little graphic there to help us understand why he got so mad. But oftentimes, when things don't go our way, we become preoccupied with self. And oftentimes, it manifests itself in anger. We're angry at others. We're angry at God. We're just flat angry people. I was one of those angry people for many years. My family was afraid of me. Um, the animals on the ranch were afraid of me. Uh, and, and things just... But it was all this preoccupation with self. When things were out of my control, I got angry. That was my response, just as Naaman did here. And that's because until I was 36, 7 years old, I didn't know who God was. I hadn't had a visitation from Elijah that said, hey, I can fix that. Oh, by the way, I've been working on this plan for 3,000 years for you. And if you will surrender, if you will submit yourself to the waters of the Jordan River, you'll understand that I have a plan to heal you and to cleanse you. And I have a plan to prosper you, not to harm you. And by the way, I'm in control and I live in the future. So if you've got any other issues, let me know. I'll take care of them. I mean, that's what God was offering. And when I grasped that concept, first of all, and became saved, and asked Jesus into my heart, became a Christian, and it was not right away, <clears throat> but over a period of time. Now when things happen that I don't like, that are out of control, that aren't fair, and things, I'm more like, hmm, I wonder how this is going to work out. And I think I'll go to coffee. You know, that kind of attitude, instead of this rage and this anger that why is this happening? This isn't fair and get out of my way and, and, and that kind of stuff. And so we see those different ways of responding. And I don't have time to go into it. I encourage you to read the last few verses and we have another slave, another servant, if you will, and that's Elisha's servant Gehazi. And Gehazi, when this man leaves with over a million dollars on those donkeys and two loads of dirt, he can't stand it. He goes after him and talks him in and lies to um, Naaman and says and asks for a talent of silver. Naaman gives him two talents of silver. And then <clears throat> when the prophet, I mean, really, folks, if you were working for a prophet of God that could see into the future and heal people, would you come back into him five minutes later and lie to him and say, I didn't go anywhere. I didn't do anything. I mean, really. And so his reward for that was that he ended up with the leprosy that Naaman had been healed from and was outcast from that point. So we all have response ability for our response. Your response, my response, is my responsibility to those circumstances. And Gehazi, even though he had followed Elisha all of those years, saw all of those miracles, he didn't think it was fair that that Elisha would just not receive a gift for that. In their culture, that was huge, so I understand that part of it. But Elisha knew not to mess with God's glory and not to take anything for what, he's, what he has done, what God, gifting that God has done for him. So, the conclusion, <clears throat> God has a plan for the entire world. Even if you're at enmity with God for some reason, 
God invites you, he invites me to accept that. And if we'll move towards that, like he took that 100-mile journey and then another 30 miles to go from Elijah's place down to the Jordan River. And, and we have to kind of, I mean, God has done the salvation work for us, but we need to receive that. It says in the book of John over and over again, all you and I have to do is believe. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. All roads do not lead to heaven, only one. And yes, it is narrow. But the cool thing, it is open to everyone. Even if you're a Syrian and you're living in Damascus, an enemy of God, God loves everybody and he's made a way for everybody that chooses to make the journey to the river and surrender. He's made a way for us to be saved. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word as you teach us and instruct us. And we see the example of your work centuries and centuries ago, letting us know that this has been your plan all along. And you have made a way for us to be saved. And as Jesus died on that cross and his blood covers our sin, and just by accepting that, just by believing in it, Lord Jesus, we can be saved and healed of our spiritual diseases and oftentimes the physical as well. So Lord Jesus, if there's anybody in here today that does not know you in that way, has not come to the river and received you, I just pray that you'd continue the work that you've done in their hearts as you have obviously drawn them to yourself to hear this message. And now I just pray that your servants, those that know you, would turn and minister to those that do not know you and to share that hope and to share that message with those that they know, those that they don't know. And in every way possible, that many people would be healed, would be cleansed, and come to be your servants, Lord Jesus. So we thank you for our time. In Jesus' name, amen.